Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome at the FTTH Conference Berlin. It's really a great pleasure and an honor to welcome you here today and hopefully also tomorrow for this exciting conference. It's, it's looking to become a really record edition, and I think we have a lot of interesting stuff lined up for you. So I hope you will enjoy it. I'm really honored because I have been having the privilege this year to be the president of the board of the uh, FTTH Council. And that in a special year, because as you've seen, we've, we are celebrating our 20th anniversary. 20 years of FTTH Council. It's a long period, and we've come a long way, as we've already seen. Um, and yet, it, it feels like yesterday. You know, 2004 was actually a year I would like to reconstruct a little bit, and I would like to also understand what you were doing in 2004. So let's make a small exercise. So besides the launching of the FTTH Council Europe, 2004 was also the year in which Facebook was launched, for example. You recall a world without Facebook? It's a long time ago. The most popular phone was the Nokia 1000. I don't know if you've ever had one of those, but that was like a phone where you could actually call with and you could send a text, and that was basically it. It's also the year in which the European Union lived through its biggest expansion, going from 15 to 25 member states. It was a crucial step for the society. So what were you doing? Picture yourself back in 2004. I would actually like to do a small polling exercise to discover together what you as the audience were doing in 2004. So the way I want to do that is I would like you all to raise your hands to start from, and we will go with an elimination. I will call out a number of statements about 2004, and you can drop your hands when the statement doesn't apply to you. So please, all raise your hands. Excellent, thank you. So first statement, in 2004, I was alive. Okay, it seems most people were alive, that's good, or you, at least you also remember to be alive. Second statement, in 2004, I had a job. Okay, I think we've still have the majority of the audience raising their hands, so there's a lot of experience here in the room. In 2004, I was working in the telecom industry. Look at that, how much experience we have. In 2004, I was working in fiber industry, or I was involved in fiber networks. Okay, now we're starting to see the real pioneers here. Have a good look around if you want to ask some questions on fiber. Last statement, in 2004, I was involved in the FTTH Council Europe. I see three hands, four hands raised. Those were the real, five hands raised. Those were the real pioneers. Give them a warm applause. So they've been with us for 20 years driving this organization to stimulate the fiber adoption in Europe. And I'm very happy to say that we actually have more key contributors to our history with us here in the room today. And those are all the former presidents and director generals of the organization from the past 20 years. Give them also an applause while they join me on stage, please. So we have really this great panel of, of experts, and I will just ask a few questions because it's great to see these 20 years of experience. So Hartwig, let me start with you. You obviously were there in the very start of the uh, FTTH Council. Um, did you ever envisage when it started 20 years ago that we would become an organization with more than 160 members and bringing together more than 3,000 people on an annual basis? 
Okay, first of all, thank you, Raf, for inviting all of us here on stage. It's a great experience. I'm a bit tired now of keeping my hand up that long time, <laughs> but, but it will work. Yeah, 20 years ago, you saw it in the video, we were a small group of enthusiasts who were convinced that fiber to the home is the only future-proof infrastructure for broadband in Europe. So we were a small group, but we were believers. We went out, we uh, contacted stakeholders, decision makers in the industry, and it was amazing, and it is still amazing, how quick this FDDH Council family was growing. Nearly every month, a new members joined at this time, and the FDDH conference was growing every year. So that was a really amazing time. But at the same time, it was also challenging, because we had to convince a lot of people, most of them still were talking about this old uh, faced uh, copper DSL things, and we said, no, let's go for fiber infrastructure. And having that strong growth and seeing how the Fiber to the Home Council Europe was evolving, growing, and becoming such a huge organization with 160 members, more than 3,000 people uh, here at the conference, that was really a wonderful way to be part of it and to join it. So I really have to say congratulations to the FDDH Council for this wonderful development. And I'm really together, I think, with all of us here on stage, happy that we were able to be part of this development. And let's go for the next 20 years of the FDDH Council. That's an excellent idea. Thank you. Uh, Erzabet, I think you've been around four years uh, that you were Director General, and I know in your time we also intensified our relation with the European Commission. Now, they launched an interesting white paper a month ago on the impact of digital infrastructure in, um, in, in Europe. Um, I'm assuming you saw this. What, what were your thoughts about the white paper? Um, uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much for bringing all of us uh, together. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, with regard to the white paper, uh, the white paper is really um, an analysis by the European Commission on some of the key challenges um, that digital infrastructure connectivity are facing in, in Europe today and possibly in the future, also looking into future challenges, possible technology disruptions. And it identifies a number of scenarios really with the aim of fostering investments, fostering um, and intensifying European innovation, but also security and resilience of European networks. And last but not least, very importantly, in actually creating a true uh, digital single market. Um, it is a consultative document, so I think uh, Everyone in this room is, is uh, very welcome to respond to the public consultation, which will run until the 30th of June. Um, if you look into the scenarios, um, very concrete scenarios that uh, the white paper is presenting, it is based on uh, three pillars. Uh, the first pillar looks at really um, kind of very much the, for, uh, the future, uh, the technology um, disruption, foreseeing basically uh, a, connect, um, a, connecti a connectivity um, <coughs> cloud computing mm -hmm. continuum. Um, and therefore, it looks into the possibility of creating really large scale trials, which are end to end, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, from an end to end perspective, fostering future um, ecosystems. Uh, this is the so-called uh, 3C networks, mm -hmm. where my current, in my current role, we might have uh, a future coordina coordinating role. And then it also looks in the second and third pillar into um, the regulatory framework and how it would need to be changed in order to better support the creation of a single market. Um, and finally, into the uh, future secure and resilient networks, such as um, more resilient and, and more mm -hmm. secure subsea cables. Mm -hmm. It's a long paper, so there is a lot uh, to yeah, say yeah. And, and discuss, but uh, in, a, in a nutshell, I think this is really a starting point for a very structured discussion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And indeed, it's great to see what's uh, recommended in the Commission's paper that a lot of our messaging is in there. So thank you.
Uh, Eric, you've been president uh, just before me the past years, but uh, I think you've been in the industry maybe longer than anybody else here. Um, what do you see as the biggest change throughout your yes. career in, in our industry? Well, uh, thank you for having us and thank you for revealing my age, Raph. <laughs> So in, in those 20 years, I think we saw a lot of innovation because you asked on innovation and change. And there was a lot of innovation we saw pass by at the level of uh, the technology, passive, active, uh, innovative business models that came up, innovative regulatory schemes that came up. So there was a whole evolution there. But what strikes me most is that when we started, it was about why do you need fiber? And with a big question mark, why do you need fiber? And we moved over these 20 years to what can fiber be used for? Because if we see at this, if we look at this adoption today, we only are at 35, 30 or 35 percent of adoption of people that really take the service. So there is quite some work to do. We have to advocate that fiber can be used for everything. Connecting consumers, connecting enterprises, serving mobile transport, uh, looking to smart applications, industry for everything. Fiber is, in fact, the backbone of society. And there is a lot of work to do for us as a council. So for me, the FTTH Council Europe is more relevant than ever before. Thank you, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. In fact, yes, thank you all for your great contributions to 20 years of uh, FTTH Council. Uh, please give them a big applause. So, just a final look back at 20 years. This is where we're coming from. 2004, there was two million households in Europe who had a fiber in front of their door. That's 1% of people. Today, it's been set. We, we are at 70%, and you see the map is quite distributed. Now, why is it so important that we keep on striving for this increased fiber uh, coverage and to reach really 100%? Well, I have a small anecdote uh, to tell you about that. I'm living in Belgium. As you can see on the map, Belgium is not the most fiber-rich uh, country yet, but we're catching up and a lot is happening now. And so a couple of months ago, three, four months ago, my mother-in-law called me. So she says, Raf, I got this message in my mailbox that they're coming with fiber to our town. What should I do? Now, I guess you can imagine what, what I answered after 20 years of striving for more fiber in Europe. I had a dozen of arguments to tell her why she would, should take the fiber connection. But do you know what really sealed the deal? I told her, well, you know, if your, fire, if your internet connection in your home is going to be much faster than the one in my home, you may get stuck with your grandchildren every day because they may not want to leave your house. And the deal was done. She wanted the fiber. <laughs> and I think we all know that that's the reality with this new generation and the, the teenagers like my children. They grow up with digital applications, with being connected, with sharing their lives through videos. And this is becoming a real necessity in our society. And, and we need those networks to really uh, boost not only private life, but also economical life. Now, imagine what the world would look like in 20 years from now, in 2044. It's hard to imagine, especially with the speed at which things are changing nowadays, uh, with AI and stuff. Um, so I won't make any predictions of what it will look like. But from a personal point of view, I picture myself in 2044, sitting in my garden, talking to my four grandchildren, enjoying my pension, hopefully, and telling them about this time in 2024 when we all came together in Berlin in this industry and where we discussed and decided on things that really made an impact and that created a better world for them to live in and to work in. 
And that's what really also motivates me, and I hope many of you, to work in this industry. Because we are working on solutions for two of the biggest challenges that our world is facing. The first one, obviously, climate change and uh, reducing the impact of, of climate change on our world. Uh, and that means constantly also looking to lower carbon emissions. And fiber can play a role in that. And secondly, of course, the continuous drive to a more digitized world where we can enable more digitized applications, often now AI driven, uh, but also a lot of things that require just more bandwidth, lower latency. Um, and it's important that Europe, to maintain its prosperity, continues to accelerate the rollout of high-speed bandwidth networks um, and does not leave anybody behind. So we need to get to full fiber uh, for the whole continent. So that leaves me with some key objectives that we as the FTTH Council Europe see as the things we need to do in the next decade and that hopefully we can tell our grandchildren about what we achieved. Those key objectives, are, we have three identified and, and we also have a number of sub-items within each objective and you will recognize if you go through the program or you walk on the exhibition floor that a lot of these topics are coming back um, in discussions on exhibition floor. Um, so let's go through. First objective, we still have 30% to cover with fiber as a, a home's past network. Now you may say, okay, if you got to 70%, um, it's not so hard. The last 30% will quickly do. Unfortunately, it is more challenging because the last 30% is also the most difficult 30% to roll out. And we may need an e equivalent investment to get this last 30% as we've done for the first 70%. So this is a topic we want to focus on to see how we can uh, boost uh, fiber in rural areas. And this will also require a delicate balance between public and private funding. Um, we will need to make sure that the business case where it's possible will work for investors to allow them to invest in more networks than today and use public money only when it's really needed. What is also important for investments is that Fiber to the home is recognized as a real green investment. This will attract more uh, private investors. And we're very happy to see that the commission is also looking into this and uh, interacting with our industry to make that happen. And then last but not least, this coverage, and actually also for adoption, uh, also continues to come back to a shortage of skilled labor. And um, we as a council also strongly believe that diversity is a way to help overcome that challenge. And I'm really pleased to say that later on today, I'll be handing out a Champions of Diversity Award also to one of our members who's doing a great job there. Second objective, it's been mentioned before, we need to boost adoption. We need to go from this 35% to have everybody on fiber. To achieve this, we need to ensure that the end user experience is maximized. This means people having the fiber, they need to feel the difference it means also the in-house network. If they connect all their devices on Wi-Fi, needs to show the difference. So the in-house network has to be up there at the same level as the fiber network. And maybe even more important in terms of adoption is copper switch off. We still have the copper networks running. Sometimes there's a service obligation, which means they're still there. But we need to get rid of that. And as soon as the fiber is available, we should move everybody to fiber. For two reasons. First of all, when it increases adoption, it improves the business case. And secondly, it's also good for our green initiatives. It reduces carbon footprint as we can switch off uh, power. So that's also a very important uh, topic. And we're also, again, happy to see this coming back in the white paper from the Commission, which recognizes the need also for clear deadlines, clear planning to make that happen. And then last but not least, reducing our carbon footprint. We need to take our responsibility as an industry to continue to work and help with reducing this carbon footprint. And there's a lot of innovation if you walk on the uh, exhibition floor that you can see a lot of our uh, members and vendors working on uh, creating technology that can reduce carbon footprint. And I'm also really pleased to see that as a council we are helping members and there is actually a boot 
on the exhibition floor from the council where you can uh, talk to our experts how we can help you uh, really take action uh, into reducing carbon footprint. So it's really a team as a council that we take at heart. And then lastly, we need to continue to look at the quality of the networks we're building. These networks are here for decades and the longer they will live, the lower the footprint they will have on our society. So those are the big themes, the big objectives we still see open. And what's so great about these two days is that we have all the stakeholders in the same place. We have investors, we have key policy makers. I'm also really happy to have Mr. Viola later on today on stage explaining the EU Commission viewpoint. We have a lot of operators here and we have a lot of vendors, of course. So let's use this opportunity to network, to speak to each other, to discuss how we can achieve these great goals. And let's make sure we can get everyone and everything on fiber. Let's do that today and let's do it together. Thank you.